Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the Director of Education at Emory's Michael C. Carlos Museum, and I'm so glad that you could be with us this afternoon. As we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank some of the people who've made today's program possible. Warmest thanks to Piyush and Harshna Patel and Jay and Geeta Patel, who are working with our Director Bonnie Speed and the museum staff and university faculty to build our collection of South Asian art with an emphasis on university teaching and study. And to Ellen Goff, Associate Professor in the Department of Religion, who along with colleagues Joyce Flickiger, Sarah McClintock, Harshita Kamath, and others use this growing collection and related exhibitions in their coursework every semester. This semester, Dr. Goff is teaching a course on the avatars of Vishnu. Many of the students are in person, meeting in Ackerman Hall, socially distanced, while others are on Zoom. One of the wonderful things about this class is that through the generous financial support of the Christian Human Foundation and the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, we are able to invite distinguished art historians to participate in this class through public lectures and in-class sessions. And we are grateful for the dialogue between image and text, religion and art history that their support makes possible. Today, we welcome Cynthia Packard from Middlebury College on March March 9th, we will welcome Joan Cummins from the Brooklyn Museum, and on April 18th, Pika Ghosh from Haverford College. So please visit carlos.emory.edu to learn more about these upcoming programs and to register for them. And as always, thank you to the members of the Carlos Museum who have continued to support our work through this challenging time. And now it's my pleasure to cede the podium to Professor Ellen Goff, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. It's really my pleasure this afternoon to, uh, I guess, virtually welcome Cynthia Packard to Emory and the Carlos Museum. Cynthia Packard is the Christian A. Johnson Professor in the History of Art and Architecture at Middlebury College. And she's one of the leading scholars of South Asian art and religion really in the nation. She's published an impressive amount of scholarship on a wide range of topics in Asian art and religion, from medieval sculpture to contemporary worship practices in India and abroad. She's the author of two books, which I should say are beautifully written and really engrossing, which I, is rare sometimes for academic uh, books. So I would recommend them for, them for specialists and non-specialists alike. Uh, her first book, The Sculpture of Medieval Rajasthan, looks at the influence of a particular dynasty, the Gujarat Pratihara, on the development of new sculptural styles and temple architecture in Northwest India between the seventh and ninth centuries. And then her second book, The Art of Loving Krishna, Ornamentation and Devotion, takes readers into temples in North India, especially into in Vrindavan and Jaipur, um, to look at how Devotees of Krishna use clothing and ornaments to worship sculptures of God that then look very different from the sculptures we have of God in the Carlos Museum. Um, I should say that students in my class, she'll be visiting my class uh, that is curating these images of the avatars of Vishnu that we have here at the Carlos. Um, our exhibit will be up on April 17th, I think, our exhibit on the, the images of the avatars of Vishnu, and she'll be visiting the class on Tuesday. And we're really fortunate to have um, access to her expertise as we move forward in curating this exhibit, um, because she's really a model of what we're trying to do in this class. We're trying to take seriously, with equal measure, I would say, the texts, images, and the ritual practices related to these objects. So I really wanna thank her for helping us understand our images of Vishnu at the Carlos. And I want to welcome her today to present her lecture, Vishnu's Divine Descents, Saving the World One Avatar at a Time. So welcome. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon and thank all of you who are here, um, especially on Valentine's Day. That's really, it's nice to see that um, that I can share some of your afternoon with you. So I really wanna thank Elizabeth Horner and Professor Ellen Goff, Goff uh, for inviting me. Um, I, I really was happy to return to my 
roots from long ago in medieval Indian sculpture. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to think about the sculptures and to think about um, the larger context that they came from. Um, I've also benefited from some interpretive assistance from Aditya Chaturvedi and Vasuda Narayana. Uh, we're, you know, going down these rabbit holes has been a, a lot of fun. So I was initially asked by Elizabeth to speak, I'm quoting about uh, sculptural images of the avatars, in particular images with Vishnu surrounded by multiple avatars. And that indeed will be the direction of my presentation today, but I'm really focusing on uh, the sculptural and historical context a bit less than the iconographic context. So um, let's get started on, uh, let's see here. There we go. So in the Carlos Museum collection, these are the two major images we're gonna start with. And what I want to do um, is to spend uh, most of my time uh, giving you some context about understanding Vishnu and the avatar and the avatars, and then I will turn toward more specific historical, sculptural, and uh, and ritual context, uh, physical ritual context in the temples to try to help you all understand where these images might have been um, located in their original 11th century world, and. As I said here on the full disclosure, um, I will, I, I'm gonna be focusing more on the iconography when I meet with um, Professor Goff's class on Tuesday, but I will talk about iconography anyway. So we're gonna start with these two, um, that we, uh, the Vishnu sleeping on the cosmic ocean attributed to India and the Madhya Pradesh in the 11th century. And then this sort of very puzzling, very arresting image known now, at least uh, until maybe it will be renamed at the end of all this, the cosmic form of an 18 armed Vishnu with avatars I've added because um, what you can't see here, are there are a number of his avatars. Prominent amongst them is uh, the boar, uh, Varaha, um, and the uh, lion, uh, man lion, uh, Narasinha. So, and then there are others that are uh, tucked in around here. It is attributed to India in the 11th century. By the end of this presentation, I'm probably going, I'm, I'm going to be um, pushing a little bit more toward uh, Western India, Gujarat, Rajasthan, as a possible area that it may have come from. Um, okay, let me hear my, so there we go. So who is Vishnu? Um, let's just start with obvious, very, um, these are very popular images that we're seeing here. This is wonderful uh, image that many of you may have seen already uh, in the Darshan series that was at the um, at the Carlos Museum. This is Lord Vishnu on the left, um, a digital image, and on the right, a popular poster. And um, these sort of exemplify what we expect. Uh, Vishnu is a cosmic king. He's a lord of the universe. There are myriad, myriad, myriad forms of him, but this is what you mostly see, an iconic form where he's standing very straight, very upright, four arms, and his classic uh, attributes are uh, a mace, a discus, a conch shell, and a lotus. Um, and you see that here in the popular poster here um, that are arranged this way. He's often seen with very heavy, beautiful, what they call forest garlands or, um, or, or floral garlands around him. He's got a tall crown. Um, he often has a, a snake background, which I'll uh, explain in just a minute. And he's often partnered with his wife, Lakshmi, who is the epitome of um, auspiciousness and material splendor shown here, especially with the gold and the red on a pink lotus showering coins into a pot. And she is equipped with um, lotus iconography herself. So the snake imagery comes from his job in um, the, the coming about of the creation of the universe and the world, the, the material form of the world, where in paintings such as this, uh, we see that he is seated on a multi-headed snake known as Shesha and um, that floats on a cosmic ocean, the primordial cosmic ocean. And he dreams the universe into existence. And as he does that, a lotus emerges from his navel upon which sits the four-headed 
um, so-called creator god Brahma. He is um, crowned here and has four hands uh, in which he holds um, the sacred Vedas, the uh, transcend the ancient books of knowledge in his hands. And there are many, many adventures um, that that are accompanied with this uh, creation myth, but we will um, we'll return to uh, just that image in sculptural form later on. We also know that um, Vishnu is, uh, so he, he's a creator God, he's the Lord of the universe. He also sends down descents that are known as avatars, many, many different forms. And here you see him seated. This is a early 20th century Ravi Varma press uh, paint, uh, sorry, print. Um, and he is seated on the cosmic letter, uh, Sanskrit uh, letter Om uh, with his mace and his lotus and his discus and his conch and surrounding him or is a full complement of 10 of the avatars. Um, and we can see these avatars, not all 10 of them, but uh, most of them in this, uh, this vintage uh, poster where he's seen as the fish and the tortoise here he's rescuing the earth as a boar. Um, he's half man, half lion here as a Narasinha. He's a, a, a dwarf called Vamana here. Uh, Parashurama, who is a, a axe wielding Brahmin. Uh, he is also incarnated as a human ruler named Rama as the ideal rumor, ruler. Um, here we see Balarama who's Krishna's brother who is shown. Um, very often Krishna is also uh, shown as an avatar, but quite often uh, because Krishna is worshipped very much on his own, he, he gets his own, um, he, he's worshipped on his own. Um, so oftentimes we see him, see Balarama instead. Um, the Buddha is incorporated from Buddhism into and folded into the avatar sequence and Kalkin, who is the um, avatar of the future. As I say here, Krishna is not shown. Another important aspect of Vishnu is that he is, um, he emanates many, 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 many forms that are, and in this case, these are not avatars, they are revelation, they're kind of epiphany, it's called Vishwarupa, um, and in which he reveals himself in his full cosmic glory to uh, Arjuna that we see down here, who is, I mean, sorry, to Krishna, uh, sorry, he is Krishna who reveals himself to Arjuna, who is the chariot there. Uh, uh, drive. He's a chariot driver and Arjuna is in the chariot. Um, they're about to face off their um, clan members in uh, as a part of the Mahabharata, a great war epic. And this is a vision that is detailed in the Bhagavad Gita, which is a separate chapter, separate uh, text within the Mahabharata where um, Arjuna has a sort of, he, he, he has a change of heart. He's very worried about uh, uh, fighting his clan members and uh, entering into this great war, uh, which is, is quite devastating. And Vishnu, uh, Vishnu as Krishna, who is serving as the charioteer for Arjuna, then says, look, you know, this is your dharma. This is what you're supposed to do. You're meant to do this. Um, and if you don't believe me, by the way, I'm God, right? Uh, don't just take my word from it for it. I'm, I actually know what I'm talking about. I'm God. So he reveals himself in this extraordinary form where, as you see from the, um, the poem there that comes from the Bhagavad Gita, it was a multiform wondrous vision and myriad mouths and eyes and heads and all the different forms of the deities and the sun and the moon. Uh, all different kinds of weapons and so on. So he, he has the universe in his body, on his body, inscribed into this incredible vision. Uh, but this is separate from the avatar. So let's, with that very quick background, let's turn to the actual context in which we might understand, the historical context in which we might understand the Carlos Museum sculptures, uh, those two vision sculptures. And um, this is medieval India. Uh, in the ninth to about the 11th centuries or so. Uh, and you'll see that uh, India is a kind of a mosaic of multiple and overlapping dynasties, all of whom have some kind of um, purchase over different, rule, uh, different regional areas. And 
Uh, we're going to be looking at this area up in the northwest that you see on the left under Gujarat Pratiharas and a little bit later, a later dynasty uh, follows. It's called the Solankis, also known as the uh, Chalukyas uh, there in what's now known as Gujarat. Um, we'll also look at this area that's under the rule of Chandelas uh, here and briefly at something from um, the, the south, just as uh, examples. But essentially, we're really fo focusing on this area that you see in here under um, the right around there with Mount Abu. Um, and and you all, you, I'll show you another map in a bit. So within this mosaic of all these different dynasties, we see that one of the classic expressions of, of, of rule, divine rule, um, is made manifest through sacred architecture. And these are all uh, examples that I picked that are relevant uh, in terms of comparison. Um, on the upper left, we see a sun god temple that is in Modera in Gujarat in the early 11th century, first quarter of the 11th century. Just below it is a beautifully carved ceiling, marble ceiling from Mount Abu in Rajasthan, uh, 1032. Uh, here, uh, and these two are from Kajuraho, the Lakshmana temple uh, in 954 from Kajuraho. And on the bottom is something from South India, but just to give you a, a, a regional comparison from the 11, uh, 12th century, 1121 to 60. What do these all have in common? Well, they are all royally patronized. These are built by kings. Um, they are incredibly monumental. They're extraordinarily complex in their architecture and in their sculptural embellishment. Um, what is a, another characterization is that they are ostentatious. They are knock your socks off beautiful, incredibly overwhelming in their grandeur, their size, um, the intensity of uh, the sculptures. Um, you'll see that there, are, we can't see all of them, but there are a multiplicity of interconnected spaces. So they have porches and um, entryways and various other kinds of shrines and ediculae there. Um, and you'll see that there is a sense of faceting. Uh, things get repeated over and over again and they get set against one another. Um, as I say, they're dense but highly, highly organized. So we always see a central figure usually flanked by subsidiary figures. Uh, so there is a kind of a, a rhythm and an order to the sculptural embellishment. Um, and then the sculptural embellishment is in turn minutely and intensely decorated. So um, right around this time, circa early 11th century, uh, is a, uh, an iconic image that comes, it is said to come from Modera, that the uh, Sun Temple area that I showed, the Sun Temple that I showed you. Um, it is not entirely sure that this is exactly an, uh, a, a, the date that they give it. It's, it's some speculation from the museum, the Dallas Museum of Art, that it might be a bit later, but it fits very comfortably into the 11th century sculptural norms. And here we see, just as we saw in the poster, Vishnu with his standard attributes, although there is a little bit of a variation. So he's got the four arms. He's standing straight upright. Um, he uh, has his mace. He has his discus. He has his conch. Um, but instead of a lotus, he's holding his, um, his lower hand here open and inscribed around it is a mala or a rosary. And surrounding him are attendants. Um, there are uh, attendants to left and right that uh, are personifications of his conch and uh, discus uh, uh, attendants. Um, so his uh, attributes. Um, then there are a series of other attendants. There uh, is a kneeling, kneeling figure here that may be a donor figure. There are rearing animals along the side that turned it into a kind of a protective um, uh, frame for a standing thrown back. Um, uh, the god Brahma is in the our upper left, Shiva in our upper right, and a seated uh, Vishnu on the top. And you'll also, I think, notice, uh, we'll, I'll bring us back to this at the end to compare to uh, the Carlos Museum example, but uh, the intensity of the carving, the crispness, the, uh, all of this speaks to medieval 11th century uh, North India. I also want to say, that this is but one form of uh, Vishnu. I mean, we know the basics. 
I have the list there of all the different kinds of mudras and attributes. But um, it is said that he has at least 24 uh, configurations of this particular standing type with different attributes in different uh, combinations. And we'll see some of that in a bit. Now, it's also um, very uh, attractive uh, uh, to compare the sculptures uh, to monumental sculpture you see at Kajuraho as well, which also have focus on Vishnu. And this is a particularly uh, important image. Uh, it's called the Vaikuntha image of um, Vaikuntha Vishnu image from the Lakshmana temple in Kajuraho. And this is an interesting one because um, on the left, uh, uh, on, to either side of Vishnu with it sprouting from the side of his head are the uh, roaring lion on one side and the boar heads that are emanating from his actual head. And most of these images have um, at least uh, symbolically, if not actually, a fierce image on the back. So this is a four-headed image that has animal figures in it, and it fits into uh, a very early belief system that is uh, called Pancharatra Vaishnavism. I am not going to go into this. It's extremely complicated. We see an early image here on the left where we also see uh, forms that emerge. We see the um, boar and the lion emerging from the either side in the back. Uh, and in the back, there's an implied fierce head. This is a sect that really focused on Vishnu as a, a, a cosmic form from whom emanated other figures. And so it was almost like ripples in a pond uh, that these, these emanations would s grow out from his body. Um, but they are not, even though they are often called avatars, at least in the beginning, they were really seen as part of a different system. But they start overlapping and we start to see, particularly in later sculpture, um, and here we see a 12th century, early 12th century exam, uh, example um, with Varaha and Narasimha, um, who are here on the left and the right, where they are actually avatars. They are separated out. They take, um, take, take uh, place and they're in the assemblage of figures that surround this central image of uh, Vishnu, who is standing with all the attributes we've talked about before, including a rosary in this case. And there are um, Brahma and Shiva are here, and then there are planetary de deities uh, up above, and the thrown back and the, uh, the personified attributes and donor figures at the bottom who are kneeling and praying. Now, just to show you what else can be done with these, um, these emanations and avatars, um, they also can start to become, particularly in the medieval period, uh, represented on their own as single sculptural images that then get placed in, particularly in the exterior niches of uh, temples. And here is uh, an example from Karnataka. Um, and it's again around the 12th century, early 12th century. Uh, and we see a fully fleshed out Varaha here. Um, who's rescuing the earth. Here's a Krishna in this case, uh, and a Nara Sinha here who is, um, and I think uh, uh, Joan Cummins, who will be talking to you in March, will be discussing these uh, avatars in much more detail, so I'm not really going to go into them. Uh, so let's, now that we have some kind of background, what's the difference between emanations and uh, avatars and Vishwarupa and all these different options, um, let's think about what where our sculptures might more, um, I'd say more comfortably uh, belong to. And I've been very intrigued by this uh, Rani Kivav, it's called the Queen's Stepwell at Patan. Um, you see that Patan is up here in Gujarat, Northern Gujarat. And I will confess, I have never been here. It's been on my bucket list forever. Um, I'm going, as soon as COVID is over, I am heading there to see this with my own eyes. Um, but I have, um, hopefully, uh, so I don't have a picture of everything I wanted to show you, but uh, let's just walk through this and see um, how it can help us understand what's going on with the Carlos images. So this is a step well, um, and a step well is a certain kind of well that they have, uh, particularly in the arid areas of India, particularly Rajasthan and Gujarat, where essentially you dig a huge hole in the ground, 
until you reach water level and then construct an apparatus around it, an architectural apparatus around it, which often consists of course with steps that you step all the way down to the water level. You can see way down here and I'll show you an elevation in just a minute and a plan. Uh, and very often these were, um, were endowed with, as you see here, pavilions, little terraces, places if you ever go to, I've been to other of these step wells and they're remarkable because they, you know, it can be really, really hot and you go down, it's just very, very cool. So it um, provides a, a lot of welcome relief from the heat and dryness and the aridity of places like Rajasthan and Gujarat. And it's part of a type of monument that uh, are, is often built um, in commemoration or in the memory of somebody. Uh, and we know that there were many, 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 many um, tanks and uh, uh, step wells built in Rajasthan and Gujarat. Um, a lot of them do not still exist. Um, and in fact, uh, Rani Kivav has been um, sort of reassembled. It's been um, destroyed in some areas, as you can see, but uh, enough of it remains intact for us to get a, a pretty good sense of it. So it was built by a woman named Queen Udayamati. Um, she was the widow of a king named King Bhimadeva or Bhimadeva the i I'll talk about him in just a minute. Um, and it is essentially, uh, the, there's a huge sculptural program that is embedded in all these terraces and walls um, or a part and parcel of that as you step from the top level all the way down seven different stories uh, with multiple stopping places and terraces. And so it's often been called like the inverse of a temple or an inverted temple. Instead of the temple rising up with the program on the outside, essentially you go down, 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 down and there's sculpture all around. And the astonishing thing is that there are approximately 700 to 800 sculptures in total and some of them are missing. So um, there are 400 large scale sculptures of deities. Most of them were dedicated uh, to the god Vishnu, forms of the god Vishnu. And there were multiple, multiple hundreds of others that are subsidiary deities or attendants or just uh, decorative. And there are a large number of female figures in large part because Queen Udayamati herself, this is a much later sculpture of her, uh, 13th century, uh, it's an idealized portrait. She um, wanted to express her piety to her deceased husband who died in 1063. So it is said that she had the well built in 1064 after his death as an act, as you see here, of meritorious piety. And as I mentioned, step wells are a big area where people would uh, endow funds in the memory, in, in honor of somebody's memory. There are multiple, multiple female figures um, and many of them are not just decorative and um, uh, sort of attendant type figures, but there are many of these goddesses and forms of the god Parvati, who is actually the wife of the god Shiva. Uh, this is a Vaishnava shrine, but I do want you to understand that anything and everything goes. There are all kinds of deities from, uh, no, there's no strict division between sectarian orientations. And you'll see that uh, Parvati uh, performed what's called a Panch Agni Tapas. It's a five fire tapas. She's standing on one leg. Um, in, in many, in the myths and in other depictions, she stands in the midst of four fires and she is burning so, um, so strongly with the um, power of her austerity that she acts as if she essentially is the fifth fire and she's often looking up at the sun, which is yet another fire. And um, the prominent, the most prominent scholar on this step well, Kirit Mankodi, has said that she um, that this that these images of her performing austerities, um, most probably or or these images of the goddess performing austerities, most probably shows um, are are sort of a stand-in for um, Queen Udayamati, who is um, remembering her husband and and doing rituals and penances as you see here, her desire to remain united with him in all her future incarnations. So the more serious she is about her ritual penance, 
um, the more likely it is that she will be able to be reborn, uh, perhaps in the same place where he is, the same life uh, journey where he is uh, gone, where her husband has gone on. And you'll see, I want you to pay attention here to the format here. There is a, uh, these are stiles, round tops with lots of figures. And then there are these little niches. In this case, there are many different forms of subsidiary uh, divinity, uh, female divinities and attendants to either side. Um, so let's look at the, the plan of the well for a minute. It is a series of, as I said, pillars and steps down. Um, and then you go down, 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 down. Here's a water level. And then this is kind of like an overflow well uh, at the end for flooding. Uh, and this is sort of at the apse end of the circular end of it. It's open now open to the sky. And you'll see that there are multiple, multiple levels of sculpture here. And this would have been a place where the water wheel would have been slung over the side to bring water up. Um, and so this is an extraordinary undertaking, both architecturally and sculpturally. It's, it's just incredible to even think about. Uh, now, what where it really overlaps with what we're thinking about with the Carlos Museum is that there are three images here of um, the sleeping Vishnu uh, and he uh, on the cosmic ocean, you see the top of one here. The, and so here, there are two here that I've circled and they are um, situated at different levels. As you can see the uh, meters that I um, listed here, 14, 17 and 20 meters deep. And so when the water level was higher, you could see, you know, the topmost Vishnu and then lower the second and then the third. So these sleeping Vishnus, these cosmic Vishnus, when they were partnered with the water levels in the well, literally iconographically, sculpturally looked as if they were floating on the cosmic ocean. So if you can imagine water up to this level and you associate, you pair the image with this uh, sleeping Vishnu, it's really a fascinating juxtaposition. Uh, and quite often these sleeping Vishnus, uh, in sculpturally, you, you often see these um, that are placed in small tanks or little ponds. Um, so this association with water is actually physical as well as uh, symbolic. Um, one of the rabbit holes that uh, Vasuda and I kind of went down, because <laughs> uh, I was very puzzled by a question that Ellen asked me was, Okay, here's Vishnu sleeping. He's on a couch, really. There's some snakes here and snakes underneath here, the coils. But there's this tethered horse down here. And none of us have quite figured it out, although we're going to try to, I'm going to try to offer some sort of um, interpretation at the end. But I want you to pay attention to that there's not only just a horse, it has reins, but there's a little casket kind of things um, here. There's an urn. Uh, there's a figure here who is seated in prayer. And um, there, I'm not really going to talk too much about this. There are, this is part of the myth that I'm, uh, I'll go over with with Ellen's class. But these are two de demons named Madhu and Kaitaba who tried to uh, steal the Vedas from Brahma, who's seated here. Um, and that's these very, very typical iconography. But here again, we have a, a tethered horse, some little caskety urn type things down here. Very, very fascinating. Um, and that hasn't really been, rem uh, I can't find any iconographic um, depictions or, or um, explanations of this. So it's, it's a wonderful mystery. I'm so glad that Ellen brought it up. So uh, that's two of the three Vishnus. Uh, let's return to the rest of the structure. So the rest of the structure you can see here is also um, here in elevation. We start at the top and you'll see that these uh, pavilions are kept level. And it goes down, 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 down to the water level. Here uh, is a view from inside, uh, from one of the lower uh, pavilions. And I want you to pay attention here to these sculptures that are on the walls. And here is another image of them, uh, just to give you a sense of the, the, the just the overwhelming amount of sculpture that and that embellishes the walls of this step well. And it's a combination, as I mentioned. These are Vishnu's. Here's a goddess who's doing penance. Here are attendant figures uh, arrayed in all kinds of um, 
very much like the Kajaraho temples and beautiful twisting, turning, uh, beautiful, beautiful um, sculptural uh, explorations of the female form. Here too is a, uh, a standing goddess in penance. In between are seated and standing figures uh, on all the different levels and um, architectural decoration as well. So these go up every level um, you add extra layers. And so it's very, very, very complicated. So as I mentioned, there are 24 different versions of um, at least at least 24 different versions listed, 24 Vishnus. So on the left, um, you'll see, actually this one's a, a swaying figure. It's not one of those rigid uh, stand up straight type, that, um, which I will refer to you here. Here are many, many different forms of Vishnu with his varying attributes that are arranged in different ways. Uh, but we also see that he's uh, in this swaying, what's called a thrice bent posture with his usual attributes, the conch, the discus, the lotus, and the, um, and the club. And, but on the right is a very unusual image. There are only two of them that I've read about, and I don't have an image of the, uh, the other one, but I, do, I did find this one, of a 20-armed image of Vishnu who is carrying an array of attributes all around him. Uh, we can recognize the main ones, of course, you've got um, the conch, the discus, um, the mace, and his hands, I'm not sure what's in his hands here. Uh, there's bound to be a lotus somewhere else. There's a sword and a shield and all kinds of other weapons arranged around. He's on his bird mount Garuda, who's half eagle and half human. And I want you to pay attention to, in this case, uh, differently from the uh, female figures, is the are the avatars that are in little niches all around the background. And note to the spoked halo, uh, which we've seen uh, in other examples. Additionally, there are avatars, uh, which are arranged in uh, a row. Um, in the second pavilion, and there's a third terrace, there are two facing walls that have a lineup of these avatars, um, in addition to the iconic images. So reading from left to right, starting, we're going to start with Varaha here, and I'll show you um, details of those in just a minute. Um, we have Varaha, there's a missing niche, which presumably had Narasimha, um, and then we have Vamana here. And um, then we move on to uh, Rama. I also want to pay, and we'll look at details in a second. Also very interesting here is a 20 armed image of what's called Bhairava is a fierce form of the god Shiva, who's in a kind of a dancing pose. On the other wall facing across the pavilion uh, is uh, another lineup of the avatars. Uh, and we see uh, Balarama, Par, uh, Parashurama, the Buddha, uh, and Kalkin. Uh, and we, there's uh, on the far right is an image of Durga Mahishasura Mardini, which she's fighting the um, buffalo demon. And again, I'll show you a detail in just a second. Every one of these, in addition to those 24 forms of Vishnu, are surrounded with a halo or, or aureole, a back, background that has small images of the avatars. So here we are, let's just look in detail at these figures. We've got the avatar frame. Here we have avatar frame. Uh, this is Varaha, recognizable by his boar head. Um, and he's rescuing the earth goddess. This is totally adorable. Um, she's seated here on his elbow, just sort of lightly touching his snout in thanks for him rescuing her. Um, absolutely beautiful. And he's holding a, a conch. And uh, these figures, uh, most of them have four hands. Um, not Vamana here, but this one has four hands. And he has Vishnu's attributes, a discus, a mace, a conch. And in this case, um, he has a other hand on his hip. And there are uh, serpent deities, Nagini, uh, female, and fe uh, male and female, Naga and Nagini fi figures that, are, um, that represent the underworld or the, the watery world. Vamana on the right um, is shown only with two arms, a parasol. These are all part of his myth. He's holding a rosary. Um, and he is often shown as very small and very plump. It's often called a dwarf. 
um, part of his um, iconography is that he he uh, plays a trick uh, in in the myth where he uh, grows to a, a large size. Um, and I don't have time to recount that here, but I'm sure Ellen's exhibition will talk about it. Uh, one thing also that is important to realize is or to notice is that these are exquisitely carved, absolutely exquisitely carved, particularly as Vamana. It's an amazing, amazing treatment of the um, the, the folds over his stomach. I, I love his little knees, that the toes, um, just beautifully rendered, um, and all of the sculpture in this in this context, in this at uh, Rani Kibab is, is of a sort of knock your socks off, uh, incredible um, sculptural prowess. Here we see Balarama on the left. He has four arms. He has a, 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 his typical plowshare, a lotus here, a pestle also. He's an agricultural god. He has his own interesting story. He has a, a fruit often called a citron and a snake hood, which is also part of his origin story. Uh, we've got avatars here, a beautiful attendant female in between who has a sort of Shaivite or tantric iconography with a skull head staff and a skull cup up here. Uh, and then on the right is Parashurama who actually is quite violent. He's one of the more violent um, avatars. And he uh, he wages he um, goes after kshatriyas or um, the warrior caste with his axe. He's quite, uh, and that's a very interesting story. He's shown with his axe. He's shown with a um, an arrow. Shown with a bow and also another fruit. Uh, and again with the avatars to either side. Um, here is Rama. I think this is, he kind of looks a little bit like he's got a clown nose. <laughs> I think I think somebody tried to restore his nose. This definitely doesn't belong there. Um, but we have uh, an arrow, a sword, uh, a shield, and a bow um, with a long uh, forest garland. Um, and he is shown there. Not very often is he shown with four arms. Finally, in the lineup of avatars, there are, uh, there's Buddha, uh, very interesting, again, four-armed, standing in this posture. It's quite unusual in terms of its iconography. Um, he has a rosary in two, two hands, uh, a lotus, and he's holding the other part of his um, ascetic's robe, his monk's robe with one hand. Um, and again, he too is surrounded by the avatars. And then Kalkin here, who is at the far end, he is going to be uh, responsible for uh, restoring the earth uh, in, uh, uh, and restoring dharma and the universe at some point in the future. He is an interesting figure. Vasudha and I were talking about him. Uh, she pointed out, and, I, and I've read some scholarship that also supports this, and that he is far more royal in his uh, iconography than uh, most images, which usually show uh, Kalkin on a horse um, but not so much uh, with, the, with this idea of regal splendor. So uh, ho kings in uh, India would be associated with their, with their mount, their horse. Um, but here we see a attendant figures with a fly whisk to fan him, a royal umbrella over his head. He has a Vishnu-like crown. Um, this is kind of, uh, he has Vishnu's discus. He has a sword, he has a, a mace. Um, and here a woman is offering him some kind of liquid in a bowl. Um, maybe it's wine, we don't know. Um, and he is um, subjugating, or at least his horse is uh, uh, trampling or standing over probably his enemies. And so the, um, the, the question is, who is this? Is Why is this so um, amplified, the iconography? And there has been a suggestion that it may be a, a surrogate or a, a, a reference to King uh, Bhima Deva of the Solanki era, um, who was himself responsible for building his own sun temple, which I showed you in the beginning at Modera, um, and who also had a tank, a, a step well built there, but not nearly as elaborate as the one that his widow would build. Um, the last two sculptures uh, that are not part of the um, iconography of the avatars, but certainly echo their 
ferocity in terms of the avatars being responsible for solving cosmic problems, for fighting enemies. We see a Shiva in his for, fierce form known as Bhairava, 20 armed on one, the, extreme, the left of one wall and Durga, um, the goddess who is fighting the, um, the buffalo demon uh, on the far right of one of the other sculptural sequences, the avatar sequences. And she too was 20 armed and arrayed with a, uh, an impressive amount of weaponry to fight the, uh, the demons and the enemies. Um, I'm not going, I don't have time to go through all of them, but um, these are uh, all attributes that are part and parcel of their, their identities. So this brings us back, I'm gonna wrap it up in the next couple of minutes to this Carlos image, this so maybe cosmic R or whatever we wanna call it. Um, it's an 18 arm image. And it, I think, is very, very reminiscent in ways that I have not seen elsewhere of um, these kinds of sculptures here. Interestingly, we have these kind of Shaivite-like um, weapons. We have a sword, I mean, a shield. Um, there's a skull-topped skull uh, staff, uh, a bell. Uh, these are all very, very reminiscent of what we see with uh, Durga over here a trident, which is normally associated with Shiva. And uh, there's another trident, uh, sorry, a, a diamond. It's called a scepter here. So um, this is an extremely interesting image um, that we are, know of as, as Vishnu because he does have Vishnu's crown. And also um, Aditya has done some great work and uh, detective work sort of identifying that there are these avatars that are tucked in around him. And we've got uh, Varaha over here and Narasinha over here. We've seen those before, um, but we're, there are also other figures. Uh, these are donor figures probably that are tucked in that are, uh, are the avatars, but quite different, I would say, than what we see here, for example, with Balarama, we do not have the avatars that are uh, replicated uh, around the figure, although many things such as the posture, uh, the ornamentation, this beautiful fold of skin over the, um, over the waistband, many, many things are reminiscent of the decoration at the Rani Kibab. Um, but it's kind of a mystery uh, still. Um, and then I want to circle back to the, dish, Dal, the Vishnu from the Dallas Museum that might, it, it's attributed to the Modera um, site that Queen, uh, King Bhima, white, husband of uh, Queen Chandramati, uh, that he endowed. And there seem to be some, some kind of similarities as well. I'm looking at the necklace, I'm looking at the ray of um, ornamentation on the on the chest and so on. So um, what I, I guess where I'm gonna land is that, um, actually, let me just quickly go back here. Where I'm gonna land is that I think this sculpture here from the Carlos Museum belongs somewhere in the 11th century in Northwest India, somewhere Rajasthan, Gujarat. Um, and uh, I, I'm hoping maybe someday we can get closer than that. Um, I not, didn't spend a lot of time on this. I'll explore this with Ellen's students, but the um, Carlos Museum's Vishnu also has a horse and all kinds of good stuff going on in the bottom that we have to figure out. It's iconographically very complex. This one does seem stylistically to belong comfortably to the Madhya Pradesh region though. All right, so in summary, we can basically, um, contextualize these two very wonderful, amazing sculptures. Uh, and I think that if you're to imagine where they came from, we could, I think, comfortably say that they um, probably came from either the exterior of a structural temple or the walls of a step well or a temple tank. They undoubtedly were part of an, a royal or aristocratic um, patron uh, who endowed it because ordinary people can't do, uh, obviously afford to do these kinds of things. Um, their role was to be protective and auspicious, uh, to celebrate the nature of the patron, maybe in a commemorative way, we don't know, uh, or just to laud the power of the ruler. Um, and these are very much squarely in the midst of early, early medieval sculptural style that is 
uh, and, and incredibly complex iconographically. And they would have been part and parcel of a much, much bigger whole. They are but small parts of much bigger holes. Um, and as I mentioned, possibly a Western India attribution. So I want to thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. I hope I can answer them. Uh, Ellen, do you want me to, oh, you, <laughs> thank you. Do you, uh, can you turn off my screen or do you wanna keep it up? Oh, thank you for the talk. That was great. Um, maybe we might want to look at some of these images. Okay. Okay. Um, as we go through these questions, okay. um, we do have some questions in the Q and A here that I'll work through. And then, please, if you have any more questions, type them in the Q and A, and I can um, read them out loud to everyone. Okay. So the first question I think relates to the Kajuraho Temple. Can you you can see the Q and A's as well? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, it's, I think I don't want to mess anything up. So, <laughs> I'll let you handle it for me. Uh, the question is: uh, go, Why is it called? Why is the temple called Lakshmana Temple? So he says, "Why does Lakshmana have a temple? Is he also seen as an avatar of Vishnu?" Oh well, Lakshmana is is Rama's brother. Uh, I will be perfectly honest with you. I don't know um, that much about this temple. Uh, in terms of uh, maybe somebody else in the audience can help. Um, I just, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I'm sure, uh, I don't know that much about why, where the name came from. Yeah, that is a good question because it isn't dedicated to- uh, No, it's got the icon. You know, some of these names happen later on, um, but uh, I, I, I wish I could tell you, but I don't. I don't know the answer and I'm happy to try to look it up. Uh, great, yeah. Um, and uh, oh, uh, Jay Shah says Lakshman is an avatar of the serpent on which. Um, oh, and then, uh, but that still doesn't. Yeah, of course, in the beginning of the Ramayana of the story. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting though. The Vaikuntha Vishnu is, is the main. This is the main icon in the in the center here. So. Yeah, I think this name was applied to the temple by scholars at some point um, for some unknown reason, but we don't want to make the argument that the Lakshmana is not a style, is not the main deity of the temple. Okay, so a student from my class, uh, Jakey asks an interesting yes. question. He's, they say, what is the ritual significance of the step well as termed a reverse temple? Oh, okay. How does bhakti change from the physical movement and materiality of descending rather than ascending like a traditional temple? Ooh. Well, because I guess in this case, I would say because you were going down to the water um, instead of up to the cosmos. And so there, you know, Vishnu is sleeping on the watery realms of cosmic water. So um, you're going down and water is sacred in India. Uh, and of life giving, of course, and very auspicious. And um, so I would say that in a way it, it, it honors the power of water and, the, uh, and, and pairing those Vishnu images with water is a, a, a descent into a different type of sacred realm instead of ascending, as you see here, for example, with the Lakshmana temple, the spires that go higher and higher and higher into the cosmos. Yeah, that's great. In terms of the sculptural program on the out on the exterior of temples, can we compare that to the sculptural program in step wells in terms of, you know, what's at the base, what's in the middle, what's at, what's at the top? Uh, yes and no, I think, because um, some with these, I know, at least with most medieval temples, you usually have uh, hierarchical emanations of the central divinity that is, are reflected on the outside on the cardinal directions. And I haven't been able to figure out, uh, I haven't been there and I also haven't seen anyone really talk about the, that step well as having a, a similar kind of organized um, quadripartite uh, division of iconography, that there's there's a kind of organized uh, plan. Yes, there are all those avatars. Yes, there's the, uh, but it doesn't seem like that I can figure out that there's a, it, the, the kind of sculptural organization, the iconographic uh, 
emanation, as it were, on the exterior walls of what's the central divinity. I, I don't really see that happening in this temple in the same way, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, step well in the same way. Right, okay, thanks. That's and helpful. you're, you know, you aren't, you aren't circumambulating it in the same way you're descending down into the waters. Right, interesting. Um, related to this, uh, Deepak Sharma asks the size of I think, these images at Rani Kiwao, the Varaha and Bamana images. Oh, just yeah. Of, they're, pretty, uh, they're pretty big. I, I probably should have put a picture of with uh, people in there. I'm going to guess uh, close to five feet. Okay. Well, yeah. 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 Four feet, five feet. Yeah. I, I really should have put in an image that had a person there. But usually when people are standing there, they're quite substantial beside it. Right, amazing. Um, okay, so this is a question I know you've thought about. Kalkin, does the horse on Kalkin relate to the horse sometimes depicted in reclining Vishnu? Well, Vasudha and I, um, we went round and round and round. She does not think it's Kalkin. Um, and actually when I come to your class, I have a whole, you know, like, could it be this, could it be that, could it be the other? She helped me rule, because I had the same question, rule it out because it doesn't have the rider, doesn't have Culkin, it's just the horse. Um, so, and then we thought, well, you know, could it be an Ashwamedha, for example, horse sacrifice that kings do? Um, and it might, it, but, um, and, and that might be the closest thing as an emblem of royalty. Um, it's not these, we don't believe it's the seven headed horses, um, who that's churned up in the ocean of milk after they um, Vishnu and the, the gods and the go, uh, demons churn the ocean of milk for its various treasures. There's a seven headed horse um, that comes up, but I, we don't, it's not shown with seven heads. Right. Interesting. Okay. Just, uh, yeah. yeah. Still a mystery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Scott Kula asked a question about um, sectarian affiliation of this. Uh, Step well. Okay, mm -hmm. so he, he's been to Patan and he was very impressed with your lecture. He says you learn more from your lecture than actually going to step well. Okay, so she, he asks, at what time or circumstance did Gujarat become dominated by Vishnu worship as opposed to, yeah, Shiva worship? Oh. To dominate other regional kingdoms. Yeah, I'm quite strange. Mm. I wouldn't, I mean, there, Gujarat had a real mix. I mean, it had Surya. It did have Shiva, it had Jaina, it had Vaishnava. So I, I wouldn't say it was entirely dominated. I, I would say that there was a very, very healthy mix. Um, where I just want to show all those Vishnu images. I, I think it really depends on the patron. Um, uh, I would say Vishnu and particularly Surya because of the association with cosmic rule were very, very popular. Um, and also there's a lot of, you know, bhakti, the, the, this, this um, devotional worship. But um, in some of my early work, I, you know, I, I did see particularly in Rajasthan that there was a turn in the early medieval period more toward Vaishnava, um, Vaishnava worship. But I wouldn't, and, and it probably has to do a lot with um, the descent, the, the the royal families descending from either a solar or um, or a Vaishnava kind of lineage, but there is a healthy mix of Jaina and Shaiva. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I'm interested in this question of when these Vaishnava images draw upon the iconography of other sectarian traditions. We have at the Carlos, you know, our, the um, the image of the 18 armed Vishnu holding the Shaiva, very Shaiva mm -hmm. looking weapons. Do you have the image of um, Vamana? Yeah, let's get to him. It looks very Jain to me. Yes, of I think, yeah. I face, think, yeah. His face is so Jain to me. And then so my question is, um, you know, when also the Buddha, of course, looks very Jain to me as well. So exactly. like, when do you draw upon, is it the fact that are they making sectarian arguments? Are they making an argument? in the 18 arm Vishnu that Vishnu is everything, including Shiva, or is it just the case that we have similar artisans making, you know, working between different um, sects. And because of that, we have someone who was making a Jain temple, you know, right. down the road and came and made the Vamana, or is it more intentional than that, that they're 
specifically making arguments um, in yeah. things like I've been struggling a lot with that, Evelyn. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The same artisans that are making the Jain temples are, are uh, and the Modera temple and all that, they're, they're traveling around. I mean, I have some uh, comparisons from the um, from Mount Abu that I can show your class where we have Durga, I mean, sorry, Jaina, uh, Ambikas that are very, very similar in their bodily postures and sculptures. Um, most people say that the sectarian thing about folding, for example, um, folding the Buddha in is, you know, is a, a very deliberate choice. Um, as far as the fierce imagery, I, I'm struggling with that. I, I think the inclusion of Bhairava and Durga in that lineup with the avatars, they, I mean, they all are divinities. Uh, the avatars are all, they're all, they all come down to destroy particular demons. So I think it makes sense that there's, that they're dominated by a kind of a martial iconography and having that 18 arm Vishnu with replete with the um, the same attributes I, I think it can it's just I would say uh, my guess would be just more, another fiercer form that's brought in to you know do a, pro, a protective uh, function and it's okay to borrow from the the Shaiva iconography, and I, I and I, perhaps there is a um, I'm trying. Oops, I'm supposed to go ahead. Perhaps there is a some kind of a tantric affiliation there, because um, I, I I sort of think about there may be some sort of combination Vaishnava Shaiva, and yes, there are um, forms. For example, Hari Hara, for example, is half Vishnu, half Shiva. This is not, but so there are forms of combined forms of Shiva and Vishnu already in the canon. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think there are so many forms of Vishnu and I haven't been able to find a textual description of this, but there, there may be one in a, you know, in a, a text that we don't know about, but there's plenty going on back here. And that I think alludes uh, that we can match over here too. You know, we got a sword, a shield here and all that. So. Right. Interesting. Okay. Another one of my students, Shreyas, asks, what have you found to be the most persuasive widespread explanation for this curved posture in the standing Vishnu oh. statue? In that. Uh, I think variety. <laughs> I mean, I, there's just, this is just this, the walls just, th they, 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 they are thronged with images. And my guess is that it's just part of manifesting other images, other forms. And as you can see, for example, in the big walls, we the tall walls, there is, I mean, it would be really boring if everybody was standing straight up, right? So I, I and this happens on the other temples too, there's an, a beautiful kind of symbiosis between iconic images and then those that uh, twist and turn uh, and that move and that show other kinds of um, postures uh, again, uh, down here, they're seated. Um, so I, my guess is it would just be to provide some variety. And, and certainly uh, the 18 arm Vishnu at the Carlos also sways instead of being one of those iconic central images. I don't know if that's much of a, uh, it's not much yeah, of a, it, a it argument, of but it's a sculptural argument, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think it's cultural argument for the variety of ways in which Vishnu manifests in the world. They're quite active. It creates a sort of movement that, again, because I study Jainism, I always think of Jain images that are very static, intentionally so, of course, because they're supposed to be detached from the world. So it creates a different argument in the, yeah, the curved lines of the sculpture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, Okay, Vasudha Narayana says the sculptural programs, speaking about this question between the comparing the program, the sculptural programs of wells versus temples, she says it's hard to compare. The organ, you, she agrees with you. It's hard to compare the organization of the step well to the shikra, the temple shikra. I mean, I think an inverted temple is, is a kind of, maybe it's a throwaway line, but it kind of, uh, maybe we shouldn't, take that too seriously in terms of being literal. Um, it just, it just, it just turns the shapes upside down, but I don't think 
ritually it's like an inverted temple because it, it doesn't perform the same ritual functions. Right, and it wouldn't have a consecrated image of God mm -hmm. inside it. Yeah, they um, don't do the darshan. And yeah, you go there to get your water, your sacred water. You see these images of Vishnu, you're surrounded by them. But um, I presume you're, not, you know, if you're going to be doing sacred rituals like that, it would be maybe at a separate shrine or something. I presume. Yeah, another question that we've also thought about from Shweta Chaitanya. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, thanks for sharing with us today about this horse. Could the horse be Hayagriva that appears to be tethered underneath the reclining Vishnu have anything to do with yes. this horse headed incarnation of Vishnu? Yes, Vasudha and I talked about that as well. <laughs> uh, forgot, sorry, I thank you for uh, mentioning that because I that was another thing. Um, it just doesn't, you know, the, the iconography, I mean, they're capable of making Varaha who's half boar and um, half human. So you would think that if they wanted to do Hayagriva, they'd have a Hayagriva image, right? They a half horse, half human. Yeah, and it's just so, it's basically a horse, just a horse. Yeah, just a horse. And I am struck by the fact that it is tethered, except in the Carlos Museum example. Uh, it's, and I have so many to show you that it's always it's always got reins, except in your example, um, which really. You know, Vasudha and I were really thinking it might, it, it, it's probably part of some kind of royal imagery, maybe reaching back to this idea that Ashwamedha, the horse sacrifice, that kings, you know, which of course is no longer an active thing in uh, 11th century or 12th century India, I don't think, but I don't even remember the last time an Ashwamedha was, there, there were ones later on, but I don't think it was something that kings ritually did in a normal uh, normally in that period. And I'd love to be corrected um, if someone knows better than I do, and, and Vasu as well. Yeah, could it relate to a narrative of a horse sacrifice in relationship to this um, Madhu and Kaitaba stealing the Vedas? We can talk about this on Tuesday. It, it might not reference a historical horse sacrifice, but a narrative mm -hmm. of horse sacrifice that is connected to that image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. We we'll have okay. to think, yes, think about that. Mm -hmm. Dave tell this horse everyone's very interested in. So <laughs> Dave Tell says, yeah. Could the, we're gonna crowdsource it, help us out here. <laughs> we can do some real um cutting edge research here because yes, yes. I think no one has really figured out what this horse is. Uh okay, so could the tethered horse exist as a warning system? He says, from what I recall, horses tend to be described as attentive and alert in Indian oral traditions. Mm. Perhaps this relates to the attempted stealing of the Vedas from Brahma you mentioned. Well, I would buy that. And I mean, I, 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 I love all these ideas. However, we don't see the horse consistently in these images. We see them in mostly, I, I'd say Madhya Pradesh and Northern, Northwest India. I don't see the horse in South India, I don't see the horse in painted traditions. Um, so I don't think it's a fixed part of the iconography, at least for outside of North Central India, Northwest India. Um, so that's that puzzles me. I mean, if it were a fixed part of the iconography, I could see it, or maybe it just was a regional, a regional variation. But that's worth thinking about. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, Jay Shah uh, rightly says that um, Jainism was a prominent religious tradition in this period um, later. Um, so perhaps I shouldn't be saying this looks very Jain with, with Vamana, especially if there's um, no, Kumar. There were 11th century, but there were Jain temples. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we, we, we have this narrative. We have a well, 12th century onwards. That's really the flourishing of Jainism in this period. But we have. I think maybe a really percent. I don't know. You're you're the expert. Is I'm not okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm not an expert on Jane Temples, so you're you're more of the expert than I am on that. Okay, Deepak Sharma says, uh, other than being a Vaishnava, is there anything else? Oh, that is uh, known by Udayamati's or her late husband's belief. Any specific kind of Vaishnavism? Right. That's a good question. <sighs> Uh, that I, I, 
I don't know what you would, I mean, this is, these are really celebrations of the universal form of, of Vishnu in all his forms. So we don't have an emphasis here on, and you know, a real emphasis on the Ramayana or Krishna, uh, Krishna. So I, I would say it's more on a kind of the iconic, all powerful, form. we don't have Vishwarupa in, in terms of that. I mean, that. so, it's not one of the later, and those don't really happen even as much in the 16th century, you know, bhakti, Chaitanya type uh, Vaishnava. I, th I think this is um, high level, royally sponsored, universal images of Vishnu. And um, maybe Vasu could help me with, is there a name for that particular North Indian form of Vaishnavism? I don't know. I don't think it's Pancharatra at this point. Right. Oh my gosh, I wasn't looking at the chat, the Zoom here. I was just looking at the Q and A. There is such. I should. You should. We should both save this chat. Yeah, I don't. Um, know. Okay. Because there are, lot, <laughs> are there lots ideas. of good suggestions? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I, let me ask uh, one more question. A great question about maritime. I'll, I'll just sorry, ask. Sorry, this is the first that. big question. On, yeah. That we can finish up with. Okay. Okay, um, Roxani Margariti asks, uh, fascinating, she says, fascinating material, wonderful lecture. Other than the Shanka, is there any other actual maritime element in the iconography of the cosmic ocean when combined with Vishnu? Is Vishnu's reclining couch, not present in the Carlos example, right? Ever represented as a raft or other floating platform boat? That would be quite interesting, especially we in Gujarat, we have influence of sort of merchants and do we have any sort of influence of trade showing up in the iconography of these images? Whoa, I don't see that. Uh, very cool, interesting question. Um, I mean, these are the serpent coils, that's the head and, and then the couch underneath, but I, I don't see that. But it's a very interesting, very interesting way. Yeah, I, I don't see anything maritime. Um, yeah, what's with these urns though underneath? I guess we'll have to- I know, I love these, these little, I don't know if they're offerings or if they're- Yeah, that seems- you know, The little caskets here, they seem to be caskets. These are the legs, right? You see the legs here. But here's a horse. I love this little horse. It's kind of tucked away like that, tethered up. Whoops. And then this next one here is shown in profile or again, like that. And there are many more like this. And again, more urns and caskety kind of things. Maybe, yeah. off maybe offerings. I don't know. Wow. Things to research. Aditya also tells us that it's probably the Lakshmana temple was probably named so in the uh, 19th century. Thank you, Aditya. So uh, we'll see in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. This is really, really rich. Um, I will certainly save all these chats and Q&As. And um, I've screenshotted a lot of these images. So thank you so much for this lecture. There was so much there and beautiful images. I'll wrap it up now. Elizabeth, do you want to come in and wrap it up or? I just want to thank you both. Mm -hmm. um, we had a it was a wonderful lecture and I'm really looking forward to Tuesday to continuing the conversation. Thank you both. And thank you again to our donors and our, um, the Human Foundation and the Carpenter Foundation who are making Cynthia's public lecture and her visit to the class possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, Happy thank Valentine's you. Day, everybody. Yeah, thank you. I'm so looking forward to meeting your students, Ellen. Uh, yeah, right. as well. Do you want me to stick around or?